Well, hey, it's great to be with you, and I just want to say a few words to those of you who are watching from home, uh, because we've got some exciting changes that are going to be happening to Northview TV that you need to know about. And uh, it's been a long season of standing in this studio on a Friday morning talking to this camera. You've heard us talk about it many times, of how strange it is to not have an audience and all those kind of things. Uh, but we know it's been so important for us to be able to connect with many, many people who are still not able to be out in our public services. Uh, but we're gonna switch that up in the next couple weeks, uh, maybe by next weekend, but certainly by the following weekend. We are going to be putting the Saturday night preach into the Northview TV program. So what does that mean? Well, it, it basically just means instead of recording on a Friday morning and putting that into the package that goes out on Saturday night, uh, we will record the Saturday night live preach from here at Downs Road and include that in the Northview TV package. So really not much changes for those of you who are still at home, uh, except for this, that because we're putting it together on Saturday night, it won't go live until Sunday morning. So for those of you who may be watching on Saturday night, uh, over the next while, you're gonna need to tune in on Sunday morning. And we're encouraged with this because uh, we just see the signs that things are beginning to open up again. Uh, many, many people are coming back to church and we know it's gonna take many months for everybody to get back. Uh, and we'll continue to provide this programming, but we wanted you to know about that change. So, hey, we're gonna jump in. So grab your Bibles and uh, we are in Philippians chapter two. You know this, we're picking up the study uh, that we've been in for several weeks. And so you'll want your Bibles with you. Uh, you have probably all had a conversation along the lines of, you know what, I used to go to church, but I don't go to church anymore. Uh, somebody in your life who has walked away from either church attendance or maybe in some cases entirely from their faith. Uh, some who have maybe just drifted, they've gotten busy with other things in life, different hobbies, maybe a season in life, sports or work or things that have kept them away from the church. Some who found the teachings of the scriptures too difficult to deal with and the challenge and the confrontation of the word and the kind of life that they wanted to live in this moment and so they have walked away. Others who would say, I've been hurt by the church. Uh, I did uh, attend church for a while. I had Christian friends, but either their judgmental spirit or something that happened in a relationship, something that they might call hypocrisy. Uh, somebody did this thing to me as a Christian, and I can't believe Christians live like that. And so they've walked away. Lots of reasons uh, why people have left the church. And beyond all of those, of course, is the macro story of the cultural moment that we find ourselves in that our culture, at least here in North America and in large parts in the Western world, for as long as we can remember, has affirmed the Christian faith. A culture that was shaped and directed and driven along by Judeo-Christian values. A culture that was quote-unquote Christian, uh, if not truly, at least in name. But of course, the times are changing. Uh, last week, Pastor Jeff talked about the changing culture in his lifetime. The move from a culture that uh, affirmed Christianity uh, to look at a Christian and be like, you know, that's great. It's good to have people like you around. Uh, it's not my cup of tea, but it's good for you. And the mood that shifted to an indifference or an apathy. How Christianity for many people simply became like a curiosity. It's like something you go and you look at in a museum. It's from a, a previous generation. Uh, I remember well as we moved into the city a number of years ago, working with C2C Network and planting churches across Canada. And trying to explain to people what you did for a living was always interesting because most people don't have a clue what planting a church means. So when I was talking to people outside the church, I would just simply say, I help young leaders start new churches. Most people could understand that. And I remember really well having a conversation with one of our neighbors in the condo that we lived in. 94-year-old lady lived above us. Her name was Margaret. We got to know her. And of course, the question comes up, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, I help young leaders start churches. And she just looked at me with this blank stare. And then she finally said, I didn't think we did that anymore. Aren't we closing churches down? And I think that that's how a majority of our people in our culture in this time have looked at the churches. It's a good relic from the past. 
But increasingly, the mood is not staying just at that uh, agnostic view towards the Christian church, but in a very short time, affirmation has shifted to indifference and now moving towards full-out rejection. That our world would be a, a better place without people like you in it. Uh, you have seen me refer to this chart several times uh, during the last year, and I'm just going to throw it up there to remind you of what I'm talking about. This, this cultural river, Ed Stetzer uh, put this uh, analogy together of how the mainstream of culture uh, in years past was a nominal Christian culture, but now how the mainstream is shifting away from Christianity, and we find ourselves in this cultural divide, this moment where true Christians are on the other side of an island, we are over there, something to be looked at curiously. Now, it's not totally new or shocking, of course. Uh, Carl Truman, in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, says this, Every age has had its darkness and dangers. The task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives, but to understand its problems and respond appropriately to them. So whether we like it or not, this is our moment in time. God is sovereign. He is not surprised where we find ourselves. So the question for us is, of course, how do we live in this culture that is increasingly hostile to the gospel of Jesus? And the text that we're looking at today talks about one strategy. One strategy for engaging an antagonistic world. We're going to break uh, this little paragraph, chapter 2, 12 to 18, into three thoughts, and then we're going to double down on one particular challenge. So three thoughts and then a challenge. And, and the challenge would go along these lines, that if you could make just one change in your life that would radically affect the impact of the gospel in the lives of the people around you, would you be willing to make that change? If you could change just one thing in your life that would make a huge difference in your impact in the lives of people around you, would you be willing to make that change? So we're going to begin in verse 12, just the first two verses, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Uh, pretty straightforward. Therefore, folks that I love so much, my dearly beloved, it says they, though they need a reminder again, uh, Paul is overflowing in his affection for this church, and we saw that in chapter 1. And again, he says it, he, my beloved, uh, those people that mean so much to me, keep going in your walk of faith. Point number one, keep going. Keep going as you have always obeyed. Keep at it. Keep working. Keep praying. Keep doing what you have been doing. Now, he says, obey as you have always obeyed. And it's an interesting word. And our English language doesn't necessarily carry the, the thought that is in the original. Because the thought in the original is this responsiveness. This listening and responsiveness to acting out on what you have heard and what you have learned. And it's really important because we all know that there is a massive difference between just hearing and actually listening. Between hearing and listening. Uh, husbands and wives, you will know this very well. There are times when your spouse is talking or when you are talking and you wonder, is that other person actually listening they might be hearing your words, but are they listening to you? Or parents with children, of course, and teachers and coaches. Uh, you're not listening to me. Uh, the New Testament has so many admonitions about connecting our learning with our obeying. Uh, James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Uh, the analogy used there is it's like a person who looks in the mirror and sees their face and then walks away and forgets what they look like. And you're like, of course, that would never happen. So why do you go to the Word and then walk away and forget what it said? Jesus told a story about two builders, a wise builder and a foolish builder. Very familiar story. One built on sand, one built on bedrock. And he says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. You hear the word of God, 
but you don't act upon it. You don't obey it. You don't do it. You're like a foolish man. Uh, Later on in uh, Matthew's gospel, Jesus is talking to his disciples about why some people hear and others don't hear, why some people see and others don't see. Same crowd. And he quotes from Isaiah, you hear but you don't hear, you see but you don't see. And I I wanna use the paraphrase Eugene Peterson's uh, message because he puts it so well uh, when he says they stick their fingers in their ears so they won't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look. So they won't have to deal with me. As I was reading that this week, the image that came to my mind, maybe because we've just come through Christmas, is Jim Carrey's version of the Grinch. And little Cindy Lou Who is there to invite him to come down to Whoville. And he is not listening to her. And he's banging his head between the symbols of this giant monkey. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. You see, the truth is there have always been these two types of people uh, sitting side by side, hearing the same message. And for one, the message of the gospel warms their heart. It, It penetrates down into their lives and they are changed. They are transformed and their friends sitting right beside them are unaffected. And it's like water running off the back of a duck. Now, it's why we pray like crazy. Lord, would you open the eyes and the ears and the heart of my friend, of my family member? Would you awaken them to their need of you? Would you awaken them to the truth of the gospel? Would you make it real to them? Would you make it come alive? Uh, It's why at the beginning of the year, I I gave you that little card, the 5 by 5 by 5 prayer card, encouraging you over the course of this year, would you spend five minutes praying for five friends who are far from God? And if you could... Accomplish that five days of the week, that would be awesome. But this need of the hour to know people will not receive the word of God. They can't hear it. They can't see it. They can't understand it unless the spirit of God moves in their heart. So Paul affirms that you, Philippians, have always been responsive to the work of the spirit. So now keep on doing it. Keep on working out, living out, leaning into your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he says. I just need to make a comment there. Understand clearly what Paul is saying and what he is not saying. Uh, Take the full sentence together, not just the first half. He is not saying work out your salvation. In other words, you must live a certain life in order to be saved. That's not what Paul is saying. That would disagree with all of the rest of the scriptures. What he is saying is because you have been given salvation, Because you have received this gift of grace through Jesus Christ, now live it out. Now walk it out. Now work it out in your daily life. And and so just in case there's any confusion, he, he finishes the thought and he puts an underline and a period to it. For God, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God who gives you the willing heart. And it is God who gives you the ability to work out your salvation. So second chunk, uh, verse 14 to 16, and our second thought, keep going, but keep going for the sake of the gospel. It says this, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. So we'll pause there in the middle of verse 16. Live out your life as lights in the middle of this dark world. Keep going for the gospel's sake. Uh, The motivation that undergirds our working out our faith is implicit in this text. The advancement and the impact of the word of God in the culture around us, that little by little, like yeast or like a seed that is planted and it grows slowly, be patient, be faithful, because in time you are going to bear a harvest. And it's pretty straightforward that God has chosen to work his plan out through us. He has decided to put the children of God, as it were, on display for a watching world. And the the metaphor that he uses, which is common in the New Testament, is the metaphor of light. That you are to shine like lights in a dark world or like stars in a dark sky. And the end goal, of course, is that the word of God goes out. 
that you would hold forth the word of truth, uh, that the world has a chance to respond to the message of Jesus. So the bottom line is that this text actually is an evangelistic text. The reason that you live like this is so that a watching world will take notice. Uh, Paul is echoing, it's so very clear, echoing Jesus' teaching back in Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's a very clear echo of Jesus' teaching. Light, as a metaphor, is used in a couple ways. Uh, Obviously, there is a contrast uh, between light and darkness. If we were able to completely blacken this room down to just pitch darkness and I lit just one single match, your eyes would be drawn to that light because of the contrast between the darkness and the light. But also there is the idea that light illuminates, uh, light enlightens, uh, that it exposes, that it shines into dark places so that we can see our way, that we have a path to walk on and and a light for our our way. So let's be clear. It's not that Christians do a bunch of stuff differently or uh, a bunch of stuff that the world doesn't do. And it's not so much that we do a bunch of stuff that the world doesn't do. Often Christianity seems to get defined in that way. All the do's and don'ts of Christianity. But rather think of it this way, that we do all the same things that the world does. But we do them in a different way. And so the world does money. The world does sex. The world does power. The world buys cars and houses. The world holds down jobs and participates in the community. The world serves as a a crossing guard and, and all the areas of life where we serve. The world pursues education and seeks to advance themselves. The world eats and sleeps and drinks. The world looks for entertainment through hobbies and sports and through the arts. And as I talk through all those things, you might ask the question, well, what things on that list do Christians not do? The obvious answer is we do all those things. Christians do money and sex and power. Christians do education and homes and cars and sports and hobbies and pleasures. So you say, what's the difference then? Well, the difference is not so much in the what we do, but in the how that we do it. And Paul says, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, in in other words, in the midst of a world that takes all of the good gifts that the Father has given us, every good and perfect gift comes down from God, James tells us, that the world takes what God has given and twists it, misuses it for personal gain, for personal agenda, building my own little empire, using and abusing people rather than serving people. Concerned only for my own instant gratification and pleasure. And what Paul is getting at is that we're to do all these things, not as an end unto themselves, but as unto the Lord. To bring glory and honor to the name of God. To believe that God has given us a roadmap for flourishing in this life. And so we go at life differently. Yes, we live here, we breathe the air, we have to do the things the world does around us, but we do them differently. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, 17, very similar thought. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So you analyze your life and you go, in in my doing of whatever it is I happen to be doing in this moment, can I do it unto the glory of Jesus through God the Father? Paul uh, uses an interesting word. In that paragraph we read, he said, let your life be blameless. And that might sound impossible. How do you possibly live a blameless life? But what Paul is asking here is this question. Is there anything in the way that I'm living my life that could put a barrier up so that people would not see the truth of the Christian faith? 
You see, understanding that in this context, the word blameless doesn't mean sinless. It's not sinless, blameless. That's not an equal comparison. It's rather blameless of being of a good reputation. That there's no fault to be found in the way I'm living my life. That there is honesty, that there is integrity of character. What you see is what you get. That there's nothing in my life that would hinder someone from coming to faith. There's nothing that I could be blamed for, that I put up a barrier between them and coming to the Lord. How I conduct my business, how I run my family, uh, my friendships, my dating life, how I use my money. That they're all done with an eye on the king that I serve. So, keep going. Keep going for the sake of the gospel because this is the evangelistic motive of this text. And then the third thought in those last couple verses, Paul basically says, keep going for my joy. Uh, So pick it up in the middle of verse 16, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, and that even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Very simply, what Paul is saying is that one day, when I stand before the Lord, I want to be able to look back on my ministry and look back on our relationship and look at the fruit that came of our years together and the years that followed. I want to know that you stayed true to the faith that you kept at it, you didn't give up, you persevered in the faith, that I didn't run in vain in this ministry path that I am pouring my life out in, and that you yourself, as you are pouring out your life in a sacrificial offering unto the Lord, that together we will rejoice and be able to say it was worth it. It was worth it that we stayed with it, that we persevered, and that on that day there will be great joy. As we look across the room and we're like, you kept at it. You kept at it. There was fruit. It is one of the deepest thoughts and longings of our hearts, is it not? That the people that we've known and loved and poured into would stay on the path of faith? Obviously, for Christian parents, this is one of the most common prayers. Oh God, would you keep our kids' hearts tender towards you? Oh God, would you protect them from the attacks of the evil one? Oh God, when they get off on the wrong path, which inevitably they will, Lord, would you bring them back? And it's also true for our friends in the faith. And it's why those conversations, as we talk to people who have told us about why they've left the church or why they've left the faith, are are so hard And as you listen to the conversation and in your mind, you're like, what happened to you? Who hurt you? What changed? Where did you get off track? What what false teaching did you somehow get exposed to? Honestly, friends, it's one of the massive questions that pastors are asking during this time of pandemic. When we have been forced to be isolated from one another, one of the biggest questions in our mind is who is not coming back? We know that there are lots of people. We, we are communicating back and forth. Many are, are back in services, and many of you watching at home continue to communicate with us and say, hey, we're still with you. Uh, we're just not yet ready to be back in church. But the question in the back of our mind is, who's not coming back? Who in this two-year period of isolation and lockdown have just given up, have grown complacent, have decided that they don't need church anymore? Third John opens with these words. Verse 2 to 4, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. Now listen to this phrase. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. He's not talking about his literal physical children. He's talking about his spiritual children, children in the faith, and that I have no greater joy than to know that you are carrying on in the truth. So Paul's words here in verse 12 
Really echo back to chapter 1, verse 27, where this paragraph began. Let your manner of life be worthy and, and beloved as you've always obeyed, now not only in my presence. And he, he uses the same phrase, whether I'm present with you or whether I'm absent from you. Whatever moment you find yourself in, I want to know that you're standing strong. But even more importantly, on that final day, when together we stand before the Lord, that we will be able to rejoice knowing that our lives have been used up, poured out, and spent unto the glory of God. And we might get across the line tired, worn out, and spent, but we get there because we've hung in. It's a pretty straightforward text. Three primary thoughts. Keep going. Keep going for the sake of the gospel. And keep going for my joy and for your joy. Pretty straightforward. But you might have noticed that I skipped over one phrase, and it actually is one of the main verbs in this paragraph. Do. Chapter 2, verse 14. Do. There is a main verb. Do all of these things without grumbling or disputing. Do what things? Well, we could take that in two ways. We could take it to the immediate context of this book of Philippians. Do all the things that we've been talking about. You're growing in love for one another. Your depth of knowledge and discernment. Your decision making. Always making the most excellent choices. In the opposition that you find yourself up against, as you suffer with me, as you defend the gospel, as you walk in humility, as Christ walked in humility, all the things that we've talked about, do these things without grumbling or disputing. Or we could take that phrase simply at face value, do all things. Whatever you have on the agenda today, in your eating and sleeping and going to work day-to-day -day lives, in your paying the bills and mowing the grass and cleaning out the barn, daily lives, as you walk through your taxes for 2021, as you give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, do all things without grumbling and disputing. So I ask you off the top that if you could make just one change in your life that would radically affect the impact of the gospel in the lives of the people around you, would you be willing to make that change? In this context, Paul is pointing us to the mission that we've been given. We're called to hold fast the word of life, to shine as lights in the world. We've got a story to tell the nations, and like the old hymn says. But if you back it up from there, if we want to be effective at getting the word out, then let your little light shine. Live lives that shine brightly into the darkness of a crazy culture. Children of God without blemish, no fault lines, no hidden agendas, no barriers to the gospel. Live in which there are no barriers that you are putting up to keep people from the Lord. And then you ask the question, well, how do we do that? How would I get there? And if there was just one change that we could make that would radically impact our lives and the lives around us, would you be willing to do it? Do all things without grumbling and disputing. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing that Paul connects our evangelistic effectiveness to our complaining and fighting spirit. Uh, the word grumble, just look it up, dictionary.com. Uh, it is defined in this way, to show one's unhappiness or critical attitude. Grumble. To show your unhappiness or your critical attitude. Attitude. I've heard people say, I have the spiritual gift of criticism. What Paul is saying is that you should not be like this. Uh, how do we understand the word? Well, some synonyms might help. If you don't understand the word grumble, I think you do. But let me give you some of the synonyms. S uh, some cinnamon, some cinnamon hearts. Let me give you some synonyms. Grumble, to fuss, to gripe, groan, squawk, moan, bellyache. Grouse, protest, whine, find fault, mutter. In fact, one of the words the Bible uses is the word murmur. 
And uh, it's an interesting exercise. If you get a crowd of people together and just say, everybody just say the words murmur, 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 and you listen around the room, that's what grumbling, murmuring sounds like. A grumbler is also called a complainer, a crab, a crank, a curmudgeon. There's a good C.S. Lewis word, curmudgeon. A fault finder, a malcontent, a sorehead, a sourpuss. Lots of great words for grumbling. And Paul only uses this word twice in his writings. He uses it here in Philippians, and he uses it in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10. And in that context, he's reminding them of an Old Testament story where the children of Israel grumbled in the wilderness. They were complaining against God and against Moses. Uh, It comes up several times and and almost identical conversations in these various various encounters that they're having between the people of God and God himself. One, they're complaining about the food, and in another, they're complaining about the giants that live in the promised land. But Numbers 11 says this, Now the rabble that was among them, that's a great phrase, the rabble, the rabble rousers, the rabble that were among them had a strong craving And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up. And there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. We don't have time to unpack that text. But the Lord's response is basically, Moses, get out of the way. Moses, step aside. Because I am so fed up with this people and their lack of trust, their lack of faith, their lack of thankfulness, and their their unwillingness to step out in simple obedience, and I've had enough of their whining and complaining, so step aside, Moses, so I can wipe these people out. And fire begins to fall from heaven onto the outskirts of the camp. And and many people die in that consuming fire until Moses steps in to plead for the people. And in 1 Corinthians, when he's writing about this, he says this. Now these things took place as examples for us. That we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, there's our word, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. You see, we should learn a lesson from what happens when God's people complain. It's no wonder that Paul says here, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And the question, of course, we must ask is, have we lost our sense of reverential awe before a holy God? But that second word is also important, grumbling or disputing. Uh, If you look up the word dispute, it simply means this, a disagreement, an argument, a debate. Uh, You want some synonyms? Bicker, brawl, conflict, controversy, discord, feud, quarrel, row, squabble, wrangle. I think you get it. A disputing argument is an opposing, battling, clashing, combating, conflicting, disagreeing, at odds, and up against. Those are all the words that are like disputing. And it's an interesting and a challenging word because in a sense, disputing and debating and dialoguing and negotiating is the stuff of daily life. Life is a wrestle. Life is a tussle. It's a constant barrage of questions and opinions and debates. Do I have coffee or tea? Do I vote liberal or conservative? What opinion do I hold about the latest cultural controversy? In Romans 14, Paul uses the very same word as he reminds us that even within the Christian church, there are many issues upon which Christians will find themselves debating, disputing, and carrying divergent opinions, even important theological issues that we should study carefully and deeply. 
But Paul's point is that in all of our debating, in all of our disputing, that we keep our eye on the greater unity that we have in the Spirit of God. That we recognize that there are some things that are black and white in the Scriptures. There are the thou shalts and the thou shalt not, some clear directives of right and wrong. But that there are many other issues that require us deep prayer and reflection and study and upon which Bible-believing, Jesus-following people will come to different conclusions on. And Paul challenges us, keep the big things big and the little things little. Give each other the space and the freedom and the grace to study the Scripture, and specifically, he says, stop passing judgment on one another. Uh, They are the Lord's servant. The, The Lord will take care of it. The Lord will pass judgment. They answer to him, not to you. Uh, And also, stop despising your brother or your sister in Christ. It's interesting that one of the qualifications of an elder include a comment about this grumbling or disputing or quarrelsome spirit. Uh, It says in 1 Timothy 3, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle. And then here's our word, not quarrelsome. Not quarrelsome and, and not a lover of money. Uh, That word quarrelsome, if you look at how it's used in the Greek language and how it's translated into English, is is sometimes translated as a fighter or a disputer or fighting spirit. Uh, The King James Version, the old, old version that many of us grew up with, was not a brawler. Uh, Some have translated as a striker or the great word, I love this word, pugnacious, that an elder should not be pugnacious, not have this fighting spirit. So let me ask you, if you could change just one thing, I think this might be one of the most important and powerful things that we could do to ramp up the effectiveness of our gospel witness is to get rid of grumbling and disputing. Uh, Back in 2018, four years ago, Ed Stetzer released this provocative book entitled Christian's in the age of outrage. I'm going to just throw the cover up there on the screen because I I love the imagery of this sheep with the teeth of a wolf. The subtitle says it all, how to bring out our best when the world is at its worst. How to bring out our best when the world is at its worst. The the title is self-explanatory because never before has North America been more polarized and divided than we are today. From politics to racism to gender issues to economic disparity, the last five to ten years have felt like in many ways that we are sitting on a powder keg just waiting for something to explode around us. That we live in the age of the cancel culture, wokeism, progressive Christianity and deconstructionism and and an age when it is so easy to be cynical about everything. And as never before, we have seen the level of cultural hostility on full display. Now, remind yourself, this book is four years old. It's back from 2018. And since then, we've added one more major layer on top of it. We've added a pandemic. And so as a culture, we are neck deep in grumbling and disputing. And Paul's encouragement to these first readers and to us looks very basic. You want your life to shine like lights in a dark culture? Then stop fighting. Stop brawling. Stop complaining. Remember that quote from Carl Truman at the beginning? Every age has its darkness and dangers. And the task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives. That's not our job. Our job is not to whine. And here is where we have to lift the the plane up to the 30,000 foot view and remind ourselves. Whose are we? To whom do we belong? Where are we headed? And what are we living for? Because you see, if our hope is only in this life alone, If in this life, between our birth and our death, however long that is, is our only hope, and if that's all there is, if this is truly our best life now, and there's no hope on the horizon, then we might as well line up with everyone else along the edge of the tall bridge and just one by one jump off, one after another. 
Because there is enough hurt and pain and sickness and brokenness to drive all of us to despair. But that's precisely the point of the gospel. That this is not the life that we live for. That we do not live for this life alone. And yes, this world is broken. We understand that. But Aslan is on the move. Winter is turning to spring. The Lord is on his restoration plan. Remember the gospel, the creation story, uh, the rebellion and the fall of mankind, the redemption in Jesus, and then the forward look of restoration. We must keep this in mind that the Lord is restoring the world. And so, yes, we live and breathe and move in these human bodies. And we occupy a time and space in human history. And we long for the renewal of relationships, uh, for good food and good friends, for beauty and for peace all around us. But we also know that our ultimate hope is not here, but it is in the coming kingdom and in the coming restoration. And so, just like Jesus, we can endure the sufferings of this life, not because we enjoy suffering, but because our eyes are on the horizon. Jesus, who the book of Hebrews says, endured the cross. He endured the crucifixion because of the joy set before him. He saw the longer range story. He saw the finish line. Or like Paul, who is writing this letter. Remember, he is writing from prison in Rome. He doesn't know if he's going to get out of prison. He, he, may come out, uh, he might come out alive, but he more than likely could come out dead He's had friends who's turned on him and forsaken him. He's had opponents who are trying to make his life more miserable. And yet he rejoices. Filled with an optimism and a joy that comes from the Lord, uh, he wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparisons. That's important. This light momentary affliction. It's preparing us for an eternal weight as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I know that it might sound overly simplistic, and overly optimistic. That if you could just change one thing that would radically affect the impact of the gospel in the lives of the people around you, would would you be willing to make that change? It sounds too simple. But this is the challenge for you if you would choose to accept it. I wonder how many of us would say, you know what, I'm willing to give it a try. I'm willing to give it a try and I'll try it for one full week. For the next seven days, 24 hours a day, between now and the time that we meet together again, I am going to do my very best to remove the grumbling and disputing from my daily conversation. Are you willing to give it a try? Are you willing to take every thought captive? Are you willing to take every word captive? Uh, You might have to stay off social media in order to accomplish this. But if you're willing... To do so with a prayerful attitude of saying, Lord, in this moment, in this moment when all I want to do is gripe and complain, I've got an opinion that I really would like to express, but Lord, would you fill my mind with gratitude? Lord, would you lift my perspective above the moment that I am in right now? Because friends, I think you know this, that we will not win the cultural battle by railing against it that we will not win the spiritual battle if we lose our distinctiveness as salt and light. And nor do we have the option to withdraw from the the world and, and sneak away into a commune somewhere to stick our head in the sand. Because as the text says, we're called to be lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So if you're up for that challenge, I'd like to pray for you. So Lord Jesus, what a practical text. Just the encouragement to keep going, to keep going for the sake of the gospel and to keep going for the the joy that stands before us. But Father, in reality, it is a challenging, challenging text, especially in the time and place that we find ourselves living, to be able to do all of life without grumbling or disputing. 
And yet, Lord, if we could just change that one factor about the Christian church, that we would indeed stand out like lights in the darkness. If we did nothing less than that, just simply stop complaining, simply stop griping, simply stop criticizing, and would only speak words of blessing, what a distinct nature that would be in the world that we live in. And so, Father, I pray for the men and women who are listening to this right now. I pray for men and women who are considering in their mind, uh, is he serious? Does he really want us to take this challenge? Lord, I pray that they would take this challenge, that they would ponder literally over the next seven days, can I get through an entire week without grumbling or without disputing? And Lord, I pray even in the midst of this week, that you would cause some amazing conversations to come up because of our generosity of spirit and our generosity of conversation. And so, Lord, I I lift that up to you. pray your blessing on those who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen.